So we'll give it a sec. Okay. I'm pulling up the chat so I can see. All right. Los Angeles, Florida, New Jersey. Welcome, New York. More, more California, New York representation. Texas, middle of the country, Chicago, Maine, New York City, Germany. Okay. Hello. Europe has entered the chat. Beverly Hills, London. Okay. All right. Denver, Boise, Idaho. Okay. It's cold here. I'm in Connecticut, Montreal, Oklahoma, Ontario. Awesome. I always like it when two people in the chat suddenly discover they're not that far from each other. Um, Forest Hills, San Diego, East Lansing, Michigan, Toronto. Wonderful. Okay. Welcome everybody. Cleveland, Ohio. Spent a nice summer in Cleveland. Close to 20 years ago. Uh, Anchorage, Alaska, Atlanta, Indiana, Cape Town, Tempe, Arizona, New Jersey, Los Angeles again. All right. Los Angeles is big though. Cape Town, almost missed that one. DC, San Diego, Northridge in Starbucks. Good. <laughs> Okay, we Rachel, I think we're, we're uh, okay. How are we doing, Mary? We're good to go. We're, good we're to all go. here. Okay. Welcome, everybody, and Chag Urim Sameach. Happy Hanukkah. I'm delighted you're here on, is, this is the fifth day now? We lit five candles last night. Yes, okay. And you're still interested in learning more about Hanukkah, so that is awesome that we have all these people here. Um, I actually gave this class a Potentially similar today. So if you have a feeling of deja vu, uh, that could be why. And if you want to excuse yourself now because you've been to this class before, um, that is totally fine too. Um, and if you want to stay and hear it again, that's awesome as well. Um, I'm not sure if I said my name. I'm Rachel Scheinerman. Shelton, Connecticut, you're down the street from me. I'm Rachel Scheinerman. I'm the editor of My Jewish Learning. And uh, and also the editor of a daily dose of Talmud, which is our um, Talmud program. I'm studying one page a day of Talmud. We send out an email every day. If you enjoy this class and are not part of that and are interested in that, we will share information about it at the end because the focus of this class is to some degree how the Talmudic rabbis think about Hanukkah. Okay, so Hanukkah, if we're five days in, you've had a chance to be reminded that Hanukkah is about... Uh, that time that Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes um, persecuted the Jews, he defiled the temple, and then the Maccab Maccabees fought him off and rededicated the temple. And that is why we call it Hanukkah, because the name Hanukkah means rededication, right? And depending who you ask, the miracle is either the, the success of the Maccabee warriors in taking back the Jewish the jug of oil that they lit that was supposed to acid, in fact, all eight. And one thing that is interesting to notice is that the Talmud, which has lots and lots of information about Jewish holidays, right? If you're part of our Dafyuma group and that's how you came to the class today, you, uh, you might have set, uh, sat through almost an entire year of Passover and many pages on Yom Kippur and a smaller on Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, even Purim gets a uh, gets long treatment in the Talmud. I'm sorry, I'm seeing my internet is unstable. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, we actually just had to restart it right before we began here. Um, all right, how about now? Uh, Mary, you're, you're pretty prominent on my screen. So I'm going to rely on you to signal me when I should stop talking because the internet is out. Are we okay? Just give, give me thumbs up, thumbs down to keep talking. Okay, great. So, so the Talmud has lots of, has whole tractates devoted to most Jewish holidays. But what about Hanukkah? Is there a tractate for Hanukkah? Who knows? Tractate Hanukkah? Tractate Al Hanisim. Tell me in the chat. Right, there's a whole book of the Maccabees, but there's no tractate. The, nope, nope, no tractate in the Talmud for Hanukkah. Nope. Is there anything in the Talmud for Hanukkah? 
Yes. Stuart says Tractate Shabbat. There's a little bit, there's about four pages in the middle of Tractate Shabbat. A um, little bit Navo Dazra. Just a little bit of stuff in the Talmud. The bulk of it is in Tractate Shabbat. And it comes, it, it sort of comes as one of those Talmudic um, divergences, right? They're talking about lighting Shabbat candles. And as long as they're talking about lighting Shabbat candles, then they start talking about lighting Hanukkah candles. Uh, and that's where we actually learned that the rabbis think that the requirement really is only to white, light one candle per night, right? We'll actually see that text later in this presentation. Uh, and I did a, a search on Sfaria in preparing this talk to see what the rabbis had to say about the Maccabees. Anyone know? What, are the, what does the Talmud say about the Maccabees? Nothing. <laughs> I didn't turn up the word Maccabees in the Talmud at all. That's right. Nothing at all. Okay. So why? Why does the Talmud have so little on Hanukkah and nothing on the Hanukkah heroes? Anyone want to want to venture a guess in the comments? I'd like to be a little bit interactive. I know it creates a slight delay which combined with um, my unstable internet in the mo at the moment is going to make this very exciting. Okay, here come the answers. Okay, good. The Maccabees are not in the Torah. They don't want to piss off Rome. Maybe because the Maccabees are fighting an imperial power, different imperial power, but maybe. Um, it was, oh, because it was more, uh, yes, so we don't talk about this as much on Hanukkah as we should, but it's more of a civil war than just a war against the Greeks, right? Because the Maccabees are also fighting other Jews who are pro-assimilation, who, who are more accommodating to Greek culture. Um, okay, Joel says it was too recent, right? Maybe it, 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 it happened more recently, so it doesn't have the status of these older holidays. Uh, militaristic, possibly, uh, right? The Talmud, the, I'm sorry, the, the Torah is not afraid of a good militaristic story. Go check out Judges, right? But possibly. Um, the rabbis did not like the Maccabees because they were corrupt. Yeah, actually, um, perhaps the Maccabees, but definitely they didn't like the Hasmoneans, who are the ruler ruling dynasty that issued from the Maccabees, really didn't like them. And we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Okay, this is, this is a learned crowd. Okay, the Maccabees were not good guys. They were terrible leaders. Right, okay. All right. Right. So I don't want to totally collapse the Maccabees and the Hasmonean dynasty they established afterward, but, but possibly, right. Okay. Good answers. Okay. Sherry is not hearing anything. Um, Mara, is that me or possibly, okay, Sherry, that might be on your end. Okay. All right. So next question. If the, if Hanukkah is barely in the Talmud, how did the rabbis even know, and, and it's not in the Torah at all, or right? We uh, we we lost you there, but it okay. was a really wonderful lit up uh, motion you were stuck in. <laughs> wonderful. Okay, so if we if if the if the Maccabees are not in the, I'm sorry, if if. The holiday of Hanukkah is not mentioned in the entire Hebrew Bible. How do the rabbis even know it's a holiday, right? How do they know it's, how did it become a holiday if it's not in the Bible? Her other holidays come from the Bible. How do they know? Share in the comments. I'll read them and hopefully come back and share. Okay. Greek translation. Okay, so there we have the books of the Maccabees. Good. First and second Maccabees. There's actually also third and fourth Maccabees, but they're not really about the Maccabees, right? First and second Maccabees are actually about the Maccabees. Uh, Josephus. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So let me deal with these one at a time. First and second Maccabees are books about the successes of the Maccabees. And they were not ultimately included as Jewish scripture, but they were um, the kind of books that might have made it into scripture. And in the rabbinic period, the scriptural canon was somewhat fluid. So they may have had a somewhat sacred status and looked like they were poised to become part of the Bible, even if they weren't. Uh, fun fact, the rabbis thought Ben Sira was scripture, and it ultimately didn't get included in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew Bible but it is sometimes quoted in the Talmud as if it is scripture. 
Okay, oral tradition, right? There seems to, there probably, li and we'll see this more in the presentation, this is true too, there was a tradition of celebrating Hanukkah. So even if we don't have a scripture about it, Josephus is very interesting. Josephus was a first century Jewish who um, the Jewish war with Rome, but also wrote a comprehensive history of the Jews and talks about the Maccabees. What the what the rabbis know of Josephus is highly debated, right? Did they did they know Josephus? Did they not? There's a lot of overlap, but it, this is like a this is something scholars really struggle to figure out. It's it's not known. Um, okay, all right, great, all good answers. I'm going to give you one more, and that is. Um, that we have a document from, from the rabbinic period called Migilat Ta'anit. Um, if you've heard of Migilat Ta'anit, go ahead and share in the comments. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Mayor, are the internet still going okay? Great, okay. So Migilat Ta'anit is a very small document that was in wide circulation in the rabbinic period. And the Migilat just means scroll and Ta'anit means fasting. So it is the scroll of fasting. So let me tell you briefly what it is. It's only a few pages long. It's a calendar. It's an ancient calendar with a list of days, largely of military victories. So if it's a, it's a list of military victories, why do they call it the scroll of fasting? Uh, thank you, somebody, for sharing the link. The answer is because on those days, we're celebrating Jewish victories and we are not allowed to fast. Um, fasting in the antiquity was a very common Jewish practice. It wasn't just Yom Kippur and a few other days scattered throughout the calendar. It was something that could be done spontaneous for personal reasons or communal reasons in the face of tragedy. So people were fasting all the time. Uh, it was a common practice, and Migilat Tan was a list of days when you are actually prohibited from fasting because it is a joyous day. Okay, so so this sort of modern Jewish mantra of they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat, right? We we joke that that's what Purim and Hanukkah are about. They that's what like the whole calendar year in Jewish antiquity was about, right? There are. I can't remember off the top of my head, but something like 30 or 40 some days in, in Migilat Ta'anit. Most of them uh, would not be so familiar to us today and are not really observed. The two you would recognize best are Purim and Hanukkah. Um, and the other thing to uh I appreciate Allison joining me uh, with the thumbs down. Uh, we we lost you again, Rachel. Okay, thank you all for your patience. Uh, I okay, you're back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> all right. Um, people have worked under more difficult circumstances. Thank you, everybody, for your patience and staying with us. I know this is an un makes for an un less than perfect viewing experience. Okay, so who are the ha Hasmoneans? Um, the Hasmoneans are the dynasty that descended from the Maccabees. And, oh, sorry, thought I'd prop my papers up. That was not smart. Lock the camera. Um, the dynasty of the Hasmoneans was established in about 140 before the Common Era and lasted all the way to the year 37 before the Common Era. They And the first Hasmonean ruler was the brother of Judah Maccabee, whose name was Simon. And the Hasmoneans were brutal, unpopular, and essentially taken over by the Roman ruling authorities and became client rulers. All right, let me tell you just a few reasons why the Hasmoneans were so bad, okay? First, they were, they established themselves as kings in of Israel, but they were not of the line of Judah, right? Genesis 49.10 says the crown will come from the line of Judah. The Hasmoneans were not of that line, but they went ahead and usurped the throne anyway. Um, they also took it upon themselves to combine the office of king and high priest. So they not only usurped the throne in the palace, but also the throne, if you will, in the temple. Uh, and they were not of the line of Aaron. 
So also not theirs to take according to the Hebrew Bible. Combining these two office as well was against what the Bible prescribes in terms of a separation of powers, right? The, the, the God does not want one person to hold political and religious office. It's too much power. It's too dangerous for the people. Uh, they also were just not a very likable bunch. The Hasmoneans tended to fight among themselves viciously. Um, and there was, it was like, yeah, I don't know. I have not watched Game of Thrones, but it is the it is what I imagine Game of Thrones to be based on offhand cultural descriptions of it. You know, it, I want the throne, so I'm going to kill my family to get it kind of situation. Um, and uh, in particular, one of the Hasmonean kings, Alexander Janaeus, who uh, probably qualifies as the most hated person in the Talmud, Right. He was the second Hasmonean king. He massacred the Pharisees for not supporting his kingship and, and nearly wiped out the whole group of people who became the predecessors of the rabbis. Right. So all in all, not a pleasant bunch. OK. And the and the Miki Latani, which includes this this scroll of fasting, which includes this list of Hasmonean victories, is could be. Uh, essentially Hasmonean propaganda, right? A way to help secure their powers to create this calendar of festivals, glorifying them, and chief among them would have been Hanukkah. Um, and it may have been that Hanukkah was largely designed to legitimize Hasmonean rule. Uh, I know that's all a big bummer. Okay, so um, let's, let's, let's now look at some text. That's all by way of background. Um, so, uh, Mara, would you please pop up our first text? Because we want to understand what happened to all these festival days that Jews used to celebrate and don't anymore. Where did they go? Um, luckily, the Talmud tells us. So let's find out. Okay. All right. So we are going to start with Rosh Hashanah. 19b. This is in the middle of a discussion of uh, Jewish New Year's. Okay. But they they have this nice uh, explanation of what happened to all those celebrations in Migilat Tanit. Okay. So I'm starting at the first paragraph. The days which are written in Migilat Tanit, both when the temple is standing and when the temple is not standing, are days on which fasting is prohibited. This is the statement of Rabbi Mayer. Okay. Rabbi Mayer says, even though the temple has been destroyed, which was a watershed moment for the rabbis, everything in Migilat Tanit is still operative. We still celebrate all of these 30, 40, however many festivals. Rabbi Yossi says, when the temple is standing, these days are prohibited for fasting because these days are a source of joy for Israel. But when the temple is not standing, these days are permitted for fasting because these days are a source of mourning for them. OK, this is a very different perspective from Rabbi Yossi. He says that once the temple was destroyed, excuse me, once the temple was destroyed, we stopped celebrating on these days because those one time military victories feel so hollow there. We can no longer celebrate them. And now, in fact, they are a source of mourning. Our joy has turned into mourning in the destruction of the temple. Okay, so now, as it often does, the Talmud has two different opinions and is going to seek to reconcile them. That's the third paragraph. And the halakha, meaning the Jewish law, is that these days were nullified, and the halakha is that these were not nullified, right? Rabbi Meir says they were not nullified, and Rabbi Yossi says they were nullified. This is difficult. We have a problem. As one con halakha contradicts the other halakha, which one is it? And here's their answer. It's not difficult. Here we go. Here, it is referring to Hanukkah and Purim. There, it is referring to the rest of the days. Okay, so um, don't want to mix up my rabbis. Okay, Rabbi Mayer is talking about Hanukkah and Purim that have not been nullified. And Rabbi Yossi says, it's, it is talking about the rest of the days that have been nullified. So here's the rabbinic statement on what happened with Migilat Tanit in the wake of the destruction of the temple. All of these holidays have essentially been canceled except Hanukkah 
and forum. And Mary, I saw a chat fly by that said somebody needs a link to the source sheet. So would you mind throwing that in the chat for whoever would like to follow on their own browser? Sure. Sure. Um, and and can therefore independently scroll back and forth. Okay, so why uh, why Purim and why Hanukkah? Why do we keep? Why of all the holidays in Migi Latanit, all these various military victories, do we keep these? Um, and let me see if I can get a hold of the chat. Okay. See if folks are, are are proposing answers. This is not a very difficult gotcha, I don't think, right? Purim is pretty easy. Why do we celebrate Purim? Probably the Book of Esther, right? We have the whole Book of Esther, which even establishes at the end of the book that we have a holiday um, to celebrate the events described in the book, right? Yes, Purim, David, Purim has a fast of Esther, but it's, it's prior to the holiday. It's a different day. So we don't fast on Purim. We fast before Purim, yeah. And why Hanukkah? Okay, let's 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 find out why Hanukkah. Um, Mara, would you take us to our next slide? Oops, looks like we've moved the slides around. We're gonna now find out Purim. It makes sense why we keep Purim, but let's find out why we're keeping Hanukkah in the wake of the destruction of the temple. Okay, this is just a page earlier in the Talmud. I'm presenting sources out of order a little bit to make a more coherent teaching narrative. Okay, so 18b, there was an incident and the sages decreed a fast on Hanukkah in Lod. And that's a city in, in the land of Israel near where the modern day airport is. And Rabbi Eliezer went and bathed and Rabbi Yehoshua went and cut his hair. Okay, so the sages decreed a fast on Hanukkah, which if you're keeping score is not allowed, right? Because Hanukkah is a feast. So Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua go and go, go to the beauty salon, right? They go take a bath and they get their hair cut. These are things you would not do on a fast day. That would be included in the prohibitions of a fast day. So they are breaking the fast that the sages decreed on Hanukkah. And they said to the other sages, you all go out and fast another fast for what you have already fasted. Okay. In other words, your fasting on Hanukkah was a sin. So now you need to fast to atone for it because we don't fast on Hanukkah. Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua are supporting uh, keeping Hanukkah on the calendar, even after the destruction of the temple. And now the Talmud is going to explain why. Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef is going to explain why. He says Hanukkah is different as it has a mitzvah. Abaya said to, okay, he says, the reason we keep Hanukkah is because it has a mitzvah. What's the mitzvah of Hanukkah? I'll let you know it's lighting the candles, right? That's the one mitzvah attached to Hanukkah. And that's why we keep it, because it has a mitzvah attached. But Abaya says to Rabbi Yosef, let Hanukkah itself be nullified and let its mitzvah be nullified with it. You know what? If we're getting rid, we can get rid of Hanukkah, we can get rid of the mitzvah attached to Hanukkah because it's just a rabbinic mitzvah. It's not in the Torah. Um, but Rav Yosef is not going to go down without a fight. And he says, actually, Hanukkah is different because its miracle is well known. And so he says, well, maybe we could do that. But the truth is, it's it's a sen what he's essentially saying is Hanukkah is too big to fail. It's too popular. It's too beloved. So we are going to keep it. And and that is where the, the Talmud lands. Okay. And so then the question uh, you might be asking is, okay, well, if we're keeping Hanukkah, how come it didn't make it into the Bible? And the best statement I can, explanation of this I can find in the Talmud is actually in a totally different tractate. Now we're in Yoma, right? Before we were in Rosh Hashanah, which talks about Rosh Hashanah. Yoma is the Talmud, Talmudic tractate that talks about Yom Kippur, but the rabbis tend to wander from one conversation to another, which is why you get conversations about different things and different tractates that aren't necessarily completely on topic. Okay, and so so now we're flipping over to Yoma. Rabbi Asi said, why is Esther likened to the dawn? It is to tell you that just as the dawn is the conclusion of the entire night, so too Esther was the conclusion of all the miracles performed for the entire Jewish people. Okay, so here we have Rabbi Asi saying uh, that the last miracle, the age of miracles ended with Esther. 
and the and the and the Jewish people escaping genocide in Shushan and Persia. And to this, the rabbis say, hey, what about Hanukkah? Right. That came after uh, chronologically speaking. And, and the Talmud answers, we're talking about miracles about which permission was granted to write them in the Bible. So it's not that the miracle of Hanukkah didn't happen, but we no longer had permission to write it into the Bible. And that's really all they have to say about that. Um, okay, so we know that uh, the rabbis decided to keep Hanukkah in part because uh, it was just wildly popular and people loved it. Mm -hmm. And we know that they also believed that there was no permission to write about it in the Bible. But there is this these biblical there are these two biblical like books. They they sound kind of scriptural that describe uh, what happened on Hanukkah and the victories of the Maccabees. So I thought it would behoove us to spend a little time with them and take a look. And then we can maybe speculate about why the rabbis thought these would not be allowed in the Bible. I'm curious what your thoughts are too, when you read them. Okay. So, uh, the books of the Maccabees would, are not incredibly long, but long enough that we cannot read them comprehensively together. So I, pulled in some selections for us to read a few excerpts to give you a sense of what's going on in these books. Um, I will start us at the beginning of the second chapter of 1st Maccabees. The first chapter, it basically describes how Antiochus marched into Jerusalem and started a series of terrible persecutions um, of the Jews. Okay, that's the setting that's set in the scene that is set in, in the first chapter. All right, so beginning in the second chapter, in those days arose Mattathias, the son of John, the son of Simeon, a priest of the sons of, um, uh, this is from the Greek, but maybe Yoariv, uh, in the original Hebrew, I'm not sure, from Jerusalem and dwelt in Modin. And he had five sons, Yochanan called Caddis, Simon called Thasi, Judas, who is also called Maccabeus, Eliezer, called Averan, and Jonathan, whose surname was Athos. I'm not quite sure if I got the pronunciations right. And when he saw the blasphemies that were committed in Judah and Jerusalem, oh, sorry, Mary, I didn't quite finish. Can we flip back for a sec? Oh, there we are. In Judah and Jerusalem, he said, woe is me. To what end, therefore, shall we live any longer? Then Mattathias and his sons rent their clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned very sore. Okay, so they see the blasphemies in Judah and Jerusalem, the persecutions of Antiochus, and also the Jews who are um, enabling and cooperating uh, in in the in the desecration of the temple and Jewish tradition, and they uh, put on public signs of mourning. Okay, now we can continue. Thank you. In the meanwhile, the king's officers came into the city of Modin to make them sacrifice, right? To make the Jews make these illegal and blasphemous sacrifices in their own temple. And when many of Israel came unto them, Mattathias also and his sons came together. Then answered the king's officers and said to Mattathias, Thou art a ruler and an honorable and great man in this city and strengthened with sons and brethren. Now, therefore, come thou first and fulfill the king's commandment. Okay, so Mattathias and his family show up at the temple and the officers of the king encourage him to be the first to perform one of these idolatrous, blasphemous sacrifices in the temple. This is Mattathias's moment, right? He answered and spake with a loud voice. Though all the nations that are under the king's dominion obey him and fall away everyone from the religion of their fathers and give consent to his commandments, yet will I and my sons and my brethren walk in the covenant of our fathers. God forbid that we should forsake the law and the ordinances. We will not hearken to the king's words to go from our religion, either to, on the right hand or the left hand. I... It's a it's a rousing speech. I am not going to do this thing. I stand by my God and my tradition, and I will not I will not deviate either to the right or to the left. Deuteronomic language. Now, when he had left speaking these words, there came one of the Jews in the sight of all to sacrifice on the altar, which was at Modin. 
according to the king's commandment. Okay, so despite Mattathias's rousing speech and refusal, another Jew decides to acquiesce. Or maybe not acquiesce, maybe enthusiastically to sacrifice. Unclear. Which thing, when Mattathias saw, he was inflamed with zeal, whereupon he ran and slew him on the altar, right? Mattathias runs and kills not the officers of the king, but the Jew that is about to, say, offer a pig on the altar or something like that. And then also the king's commissioner who compelled men to sacrifice. He killed at that time, right? Then he kills the king's men. And then for good measure, he pulls the altar down. Thus dealt he zealously for the law of God, at, like as Phineas did unto Zambri, the son of Salem. This is a reference to uh, Pinchas. That's usually how it's more common. The, this character's name is known to Jews, right? Who um, similarly in the Hebrew Bible sort of zealously dispatched a man and a woman in, in an adulterous relationship. He was so outraged by the desecration of God's law. Okay. And then Mattathias is not done, right? Second paragraph, he cried throughout the city with a loud voice saying, whosoever is zealous for the law and maintaineth the covenant, let him follow me. So he and his sons fled into the mountains and left all that ever they had in the city. Then many that sought after justice and judgment went down into the wilderness to dwell there, both they and their children and their wives and their cattle. So he has led a contingent into the wilderness to prepare to do battle for God. Okay, next slide. Uh, now, when it came, when it was told the king's servants, when the king's servants found out how it's all going in Jerusalem, not good, they pursued after them, meaning the Maccabees, a great number, and having overtaken them, they camped against them and made war against them on the Sabbath day. Okay, so the king's soldiers start besieging the Maccabees on Shabbat. Howbeit they, meaning the Jews, answered them not, neither cast they a stone at them, nor stopped the places where they lay hid. But they said, let us die all in our innocency. Heaven and earth will testify for us that ye put us to death wrongfully. So they rose up in battle against uh, against them in battle on the Sabbath, and they slew them and their wives and children and their cattle to the number of a thousand people. Okay, so the Maccabees are hanging out in the hills with their people, and they're being attacked on Shabbat, and they refuse to fight back because they don't want to desecrate God's law against fighting on the Sabbath. Now, when Mattathias and his friends understood hereof, when they heard about it, they mourned for them right sore. Do you love this translation? <laughs> Feels appropriate to the material to me. And one of them said to another, if we all do as our brethren have done and fight not for our lives and laws, they will now quickly root us out of the earth. Okay. If we all, if we continue on this way, we're never going to win this battle. They're just going to slaughter us all. At that time, therefore, they decreed whosoever shall come to make battle with us on the Sabbath day, we will fight against them. They decide they're going to fight on Shabbat, even though it's a desecration of Shabbat, because it's the only way to survive. Then Mattathias and his friends went round about and pulled down the altars. And what children whosoever they found within the coast of Israel uncircumcised, those they circumcised valiantly. So they recovered the law out of the hands of the Gentiles and out of the hands of the king. Neither suffered they the sinner to triumph. Okay, now not only are they fighting on Shabbat, but now they are more actively pulling down altars to pagan gods and circumcising Jewish children whose parents have not circumcised them. Okay, I think that's all I brought. Is that right, Mara? Is the next slide not, not Maccabees? I think that's all I brought to share from this slide. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's stay, let's stay with the Maccabees for a second, not go on to the next slide for a minute. Okay. So the question is, um, why is this not scripture? What do you think? On the understanding that there were many books in antiquity that were inspired by Jewish history and a love of God, and some of them made it into the Bible and some did not. Um, it's in Greek, Susanna says. That is true. It's in Greek. Although scholars think there was a Hebrew original that has been lost to us. But it was probably, at least, uh, it was probably written in Hebrew first. Okay, Jews killing Jews. 
Yeah, that's not a great look. That makes us pretty uncomfortable. On the other hand, we certainly have something similar in the story of Pinchas, right? Okay, we haven't heard God speak, but God doesn't speak in Esther, right? At least not directly. The rabbis had not yet established pikuach nefesh for fighting on Shabbat. Maybe the problem is Jews fighting on Sabbath, though. Um, create victory to the... Uh, uh, okay, and Stuart is suggesting some, something similar to what we have above, that maybe the, the victory is being credited too much to the Maccabees and not enough to God. Though we might say some of the same things about Esther. Um, so the answer to this, I, I love reading your thoughts, is I don't know, um, but I'm going to speculate. Um, I do think that... Um, are you not hearing me? Oh, I just have some background noise. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. I, I'm going to speculate. I, I, we do know that the rabbi there, by the time we get to the time of the rabbis there, they were, the rabbis were very sensitive to Jew on Jew violence and to zealotry. Both of those things made them extremely uncomfortable. And I suspect that, uh, certain aspects of this book just did not sit well with them. Um, although we know that it did, it was circulated as a, a significant, possibly divinely inspired book in Jewish communities, especially in Alexandria in Greek, uh, which is how it ended up um, in some Christian canons, right? It's in the Catholic canon, for instance, that it, for them, it is scripture, so, which is kind of a little surprising to people when they find out that Jews don't have the books of Maccabees as scriptures, but some Christians do. Okay, so um, so the Maccabees aren't in the Bible, um, and uh, but uh, do you know who from the from the Hanukkah story is in the Bible? Oh yes, this is another good speculation. Was it maybe the Hasmoneans versus the Pharisees? Not not a love match, the Hasmoneans and the Pharisees, possibly. Ah, Judith. Okay. Um, that that's a that's a good answer. I Judith is not in the Hebrew Bible either. Judith is also only in the Christian Bible, the similar status book to the Maccabees. Um, and Judith is for various complicated reasons associated with Hanukkah, but I meant somebody more directly in the in the Hanukkah story. Somebody more directly in the Hanukkah story is in the Bible. No, not Alexander. We're, we're not not Alex, Alexander was dead by this time. He's the beginning of Hellenization, but um, but the, the Maccabean fight, right? Alexander is like uh, 322 or so is, is the key date for him. Antiochus, right? Now we're in the second century where we fast, fast forwarded 150 years or so, right? Antiochus is in the Bible. And if you didn't know that, uh, don't feel too bad because he's not mentioned by name. He's mentioned in code. Okay, so you could be well forgiven for not knowing that he's in the Bible. Um, and the other reason you could be forgiven for that is that he's in one of the books of the Bible that I contend Jews read the least. Uh, anyone know which book we find Antiochus in? Not named? Ah, well, Mara's going to put it on the screen for us. It's going to make this a little easier to guess, right? It's, it's the book of Daniel. Okay, there are sort of two books in the Hebrew Bible that are about the Jewish diaspora experience, Jews living outside the land of Israel and having to cope with a host culture that isn't necessarily entirely hospitable. One of them is Esther, right? And the other is Daniel, which is usually much less known to Jews. And by the time we're done reading a little, if you if you don't have an intuition about why that, that is, by the time we finish reading this excerpt, you might. Uh, because it, it if, if you're not familiar with Daniel, you're gonna wonder if this really even, I, I don't know if I should say it this way, but like, does this even belong in the Bible? It doesn't sound of a piece with so many other things in the Hebrew Bible. It's really out there for the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so the book of Daniel is um, is, an, is is about Jews in diaspora and and in danger. And a lot of what transpires in the book of Daniel are pro visions and prophecies. Uh, and this this particular passage that I brought to you today. Uh, I brought it because this is where we find Antiochus. Um, and also, be uh, it, 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 sorry, not also. And it is toward 
closer to the end of the book. And it is a vision that Daniel himself has. In the early parts of the book, we get more stories about Daniel in the court of foreign kings, interpreting their dreams, kind of Joseph-like. Um, but in the toward the end of the book, we start getting Daniel's own visions um, about the course of history. Um, so here's, here's the one I would like to share. It's in chapter seven. In my vision at night, I saw the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. Four mighty beasts different from each other emerged from the sea. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. As I looked on, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted off the ground and set on its feet like a man and given the mind of a man. Okay, so four beasts emerging from the sea. Beast number one, a lion. I highlighted them to make this a little easier to follow. Then I saw a second different beast, which was like a bear, but raised on one side and with three fangs in its mouth along among its teeth. It was told, arise, eat much meat. If these seem like bizarre references, that's because these are meant to be thinly coded language that uh, uh, about the uh, about the world of the people who wrote this. And it would and and so these are all symbols that would have been easily interpretable to them very thinly veiled. After that, as I looked on, there was another one, third beast, like a leopard. And it had four on its back, four wings, like those of a bird. The beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. After that, as I looked on in the night vision, there was a fourth beast, fearsome, dreadful, and very powerful with great iron teeth. The last beast is the only one that isn't given an anim a recognizable animal, but it does have terrible iron teeth that devoured and crushed and stamped the remains with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts which had gone before it, and it had 10 horns. And while I was gazing upon these 10 horns of the last be beast, a new little horn sprouted up among them. Three of the older horns were uprooted to make room for it. There were eyes in this horn like those of a man and a mouth that spoke arrogantly. Okay, so... If that all kind of washed over you, I brought a visual. So Mara, the next slide is a, an artist's rendering of these beasts. Okay, so on the left, you can see the lion. Then next is the bear. Then the, well, I think the four-headed one is, it, right? That was a leopard with wings, maybe? See, it gets confusing. <laughs> I get confused with these beasts. And then the last one on the right, that's the one with 10 horns, three of them uprooted for a fourth that sprouted. Okay, that is a... That is, if you were an ancient reader, a clear reference to Antiochus, right? Who was born fourth in the line in line to the throne and uprooted his own family members. Some think he had them murdered. That seems entirely likely um, so that he could gain the throne. Okay. And the, and the horn speaks arrogantly. And as we know, Antiochus styled himself Epiphanes, which means God manifest. So if that's not arrogant, I don't know what is. All right, let's continue then with um, Daniel's speech. Da I'm sorry, not Daniel's speech, his dream. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, if I didn't say it, I should say, the, and if it wasn't clear, those beasts were understood as the succession of empires, the last of which is the Greek empire and the last horn of which is Antiochus. Okay. So it's a, the beasts are a vision of history as a rolling series of predatory empires that come and then are destroyed and then the next one comes. But we're going to put an end to that cycle now in the next few verses. Okay. And Daniel says, as I looked on, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His garment was like white snow and the hair of his head was like wham lamb's wool. His throne was tongues of flame. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire streamed forth from him and thousands upon thousands served him. Myriads upon myriads attended him. Okay, who's who's this? Um, I can't see the chat. Let me see. Who's, who's this? Who's this ancient of days? Yeah, it's God. Okay, this is one, one thing that sometimes surprises Jews when they hop into this because we're used to thinking of of Jewish tradition as being reluctant to anthropomorphize God, but the Bible isn't always. Some biblical books aren't always, and, and the book of Daniel is not afraid to. Uh, and some of this imagery may be familiar to you with other from other parts of the 
Bible, right? We have God sitting on a wheeled, a fiery wheeled chariot, right? That's that's familiar to us from from visions in in some of the major prophets in the Hebrew Bible, for instance. Um, yes, yes, this image of God as a old man with a flowing robe, right? It doesn't come from nowhere, right? It doesn't come from nowhere. Okay. All right. So what's God do then? Because the air of the arrogant words that the horn spoke, the beast was killed. As I looked on the ancient of days destroys that last beast. Its body was destroyed and it was consigned to the flames. Okay. Finally, an end to this um, empire. Let's see what happens next. And as I looked on in the night vision, one like a human being came with the clouds of heaven. He reached the ancient of days and he was presented to him. Dominion, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples and nations of every language must serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingship, one shall that, that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so who's the second figure that approaches the ancient of days? And is given dominion and glory and everybody will serve him forever. Yep, Stuart the, and Leah and Jeff. Yes, that's that's the Messiah, right? Okay. Um, and this also sometimes surprises Jews to find out that we have this in our scripture, right? The book of Daniel predicted uh, that Antiochus would be defeated by God. And then that would usher in the Messianic era. Right. And the Messiah would come and unite humanity under his kingship and, and in their service of the true God. Um, OK. So you can see why and I think you can see from this why Jews tend to read this book, I think, a little bit less and Christians tend to read it a little bit more. Right. I never like to speak for Christians, uh, not an expert. But you can see the the clear messianic overtones here, mm -hmm. and the Jews who who um, see this, who believe that the Messiah has not arrived, it makes this this is a difficult text to figure out what to do with, and we don't read it in um, in synagogue. But what I want to draw your attention to here is how differently the Book of Daniel handles the crisis of Antiochus than the books of the Maccabees, right? They're totally, totally different. In the books of the Maccabees, um, it is a small band of humans who come in and fight the evil king and overthrow him. And in the book of Daniel, the human beings are not encouraged to fight the evil king, right? It is God who's going to put an end to the evil king. Total, and, and the humans really... Their role is to sit back and be as righteous as possible to encourage God's compassion. But this is God's fight. Totally, totally different view. And you can understand also why two, these two might not dwell together well in, in the Jewish canon, though certainly the Jewish canon does include many different perspectives that don't always dwell so easily together. All right, so let's head back to the Talmud now. Um to see a little bit more of what the sages do uh, with Hanukkah, this holiday that uh, is based on an, on an event that they're not sure about, not sure if the Maccabees actually had these victories. Uh, and they do know that the Maccabean, um, the, that the Maccabean dynasty resulted in a very difficult dynasty, right? The Hasmidean dynasty uh, and not in the Messianic era. So what do, wh how do we think about this holiday? Uh, and as, as we mentioned earlier in this discussion, um, most of the discussion of Hanukkah comes from Tractate Shabbat. So uh, let's go there. Um, this is one of the most famous discussions of Hanukkah in Tractate Shabbat. Uh, did I say, okay, Jana, did I say Hanukkah means rededicate? means dedication, not rededication. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That might have been a slip of my tongue. Okay. The sages taught the mitzvah of Hanukkah is a, is a light for a person and his household, right? The, the bare requirement of Hanukkah is to light a single light each night. And the Mihadrim, those who are meticulous in the performance of mitzvot, kindle a light for each and every person in the household, right? So if I have a family of three, I would light three lights every night. 
And the mihadrine, minha mihadrine, the most meticulous in the performance of mitzvot. Well, there's a disagreement. Beit Shammai say on the first day, one kindles eight lights and from there on gradually decreases down to one. And Beit Hillel say on the first day, one kindles one light and from there on gradually increases. And of course, I don't need to tell you that Beit Hillel, as he usually did, win, wins this argument. And that, and these days we all like the light, like the mihadrin, minha mihadrin. We all light up to eight candles. Okay. And then the con conversation continues where I'm not going to bring it all, though some of it is, is interesting and fun to explore, right? Why does... Hillel say we increase. Why does Shammai say we de decrease? Why eight candles at all? Where do you put the menorah? Um, do you put it outside? Do you put it inside? What if it's a time of persecution? Can you move it inside? Right? Um, can you use the lights of the Hanukkah menorah to do work? Can you benefit from the lights? Can you not? Right? Uh, we're going to skip over um, all of that for now down the page because there's a more interesting text to me for our purposes today. Uh, probably my most favorite statement in the Talmud about Hanukkah, right? Then we get this statement. After all of that, <laughs> we get this statement. What is Hanukkah, right? <laughs> like somebody does, is not quite sure what this holiday is, which is so uh, funny and interesting to me. It suggests that that maybe in, in some, some uh, rabbinic circles, it had kind of fallen into a bit of disuse. So they explain Starting on the 25th of Kislev, the days of Hanukkah are eight. One may not eulogize on them and one may not fast on them, right? They're celebration days. When the Greeks entered the temple, they defiled all the oils that were in the temple. And when the Hasmonean monarchy overcame them and emerged victorious over them, they searched and found only one cruise of oil that was placed with a seal of the high priest. And there was sufficient oil there to light the menorah for only one day. A miracle occurred and it lit the menorah for eight days. And the next year, the sages instituted those days and made them holidays with the recitation of Hallel and the singing of Thanksgiving in prayer and blessings. Okay, so we have this different story about what occurred on Hanukkah with the oil, uh, likely, as I'm seeing some people say in the comments, to detract a little bit from the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans, right? If, if, the, if the Maccabees and Hasmoneans wanted everyone to think of Hanukkah as their main victory and a way to solidify their own power, if you are suspicious of their monarchy and not so happy with it, you might want to hang it on a different peg, hang the holiday on a different peg. And so the peg here is a different miracle, the miracle of the oil. Okay, and I have one more text to share with you today. Hopefully you're thoroughly confused about Hanukkah now, and I would like to confuse you just a little bit more. Okay, we're going to switch tractates. One more Talmudic text. We're going to go over to Abu Zarah, which is the rabbinic tractate that deals with idolatry, which you are not supposed to do. If you've read the Ten Commandments recently, you might remember. Okay, and here's... This is this is really interesting and suggestive to me. Uh, well, yeah, Lois will talk about why the 25th of Kislev in just a minute. Um, and there are the festival, and these are the festivals of the Gentiles, Kalenda, Saturnalia, and Cretesis, and the day of the festival of their kings, and the birthday of the king, and the anniversary of the day of the death of the king. This is the statement of Rabbi Mayer. Go ahead, we'll keep going. Um uh, Rabbi Hanan Bar Rava says, Kalenda is celebrated during the eight days after the winter solstice, and Saturnalia is celebrated during the eight days before the winter solstice. Okay, so we have these Gentile festivals. Each of them is eight days, and they flank the winter solstice, right? Two back-to-back eight-day festivals around the winter solstice that the, that the Gentiles are celebrating. And the sages taught. When Adam, the first man, saw that the day was progressively diminishing, and he said, woe is me, perhaps because I sinned, the world is becoming dark around me and will return to chaos and disorder. And this is the death that was sentenced upon me from heaven as it is written, and to dust you shall return. He rose and spent eight days in fasting and prayer. Okay, so they're trying to explain these back-to-back eight-day festivals around the winter solstice. And they say it all goes back to Adam, the first man, if you recall, Adam was created in the autumn, right? If you follow, if, if you think of T, uh, first of Tishrei as R Rosh Hashanah as the birthday of the world, that's when the creation would have happened. And from Tishrei onward, we know that the days are diminishing in length. If you are 
in the Northern Hemisphere, which the sages were, right? So um, it's becoming progressively darker every day. And this is distressing Adam. He believes that the that the day is going to uh, disappear entirely. And so uh, he and, and he thinks his end is coming. Uh, the sun will eventually disappear and his end will come. I apologize for can you guys hear the dogs barking? <laughs> apologize for that. Once he saw that the season of Tebet arrived, Adam, Okay, Tebet is right around the solstice. It's the month that follows Kislev. And saw that the day was progressively lengthening. He said, this is the order of the world. He said, oh, oh, now I get it. The days shrink and then they grow again. He went and observed a festival for eight days. Upon the next year, he observed both these and these days as festivities. So in the following year, he, he observed the eight days before the solstice and also the eight days after the solstice to commemorate this first year that he had where he thought he was going to die and then the days started to lengthen again. And he established these festivals for the sake of heaven, but they, the Gentiles, established them for the sake of idol worship. Okay, so this, this these eight-day festivals are available to everybody and they uh, originate actually not with the Maccabees or anything like that, but with Adam, with the very first man. And um, getting back to the 25th of Kislev, right? If you start Hanukkah on the 25th of Kislev, that leads you pretty much right up to the winter solstice. It's it's not perfect, right? Because we know the Jewish calendar is lunar solar and the holidays slide back and forth a little bit every year. But if you peg Hanukkah to the 25th of Kislev, that pretty much has you celebrate it right into the teeth of the winter solstice, more or less, except, you know, when it overlaps Thanksgiving or something like that. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, that is all that I brought, right? I don't have another slide, right, Mara? Just checking. There's not one more sneaking back there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what do we do with all this that we just put on the table? Um, I am not going to tell you exactly what to do with it, um, but I'll tell you some thoughts that emerge from it for me. I think that um, when we look at all these ancient texts about Hanukkah and the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans, we see that Judaism has room for some very different ideas about dealing with persecution of the Jews, right? If we look at Maccabees, we see... And, and the way Hanukkah has come down to us at this time, we see a model in which um, it is virtuous to fight zealously against persecution. But if we look at the book of Daniel, we see an opposite idea, right? We see this idea that maybe what we should do is concentrate on our own righteousness and our own observance and trust in God to save us. And I think probably if we, if we think about it, there are moments when both postures could make sense, right, historically and maybe even in our own lives. And we also see in these texts um, room for different ways of thinking about Hanukkah, whether you want to think about it as celebrating a Hasmonean victory, military victory, or you want to concentrate on a divine victory of, of oil or a divine miracle, rather, of oil that burns for eight days, or even as a more universal winter celebration of light overcoming darkness that dates all the way back to Adam and Eve. Um, I think uh, the fun of these texts and seeing the way these ideas about Hanukkah developed makes us realize that there is room for a lot of authentically Jewish approaches to the holiday. Um, but I, you know, oh, we're right on the hour, but I, you know, in the like seconds that remain to us, I would be very happy to hear uh, what came of some of this for you. For you, uh, I titled this talk "The Hanukkah Story You Never Heard" because I feel like the Adam and Eve part really comes out of left wing for people. Uh, um, some of this maybe maybe doesn't. Okay, how do we get a recording of this? Uh, practical questions are good too. Okay, so let's let's toggle to practical questions. Then people can also share insights if they wish. How do we get a recording? So my Jewish learning has a YouTube channel, my Jewish learning calm. <laughs> on YouTube. There's actually a recording of last year's class in my uh, previous apartment, which is a lot more crowded. So you can see the same presentation with a much more cluttered background. 
Um, I don't know if we're going to put, uh, Mayor, are, are we planning to put this second recording up as well? Yes, we'll share this recording along with uh, the PowerPoint presentation on YouTube, and we will send that out to everyone who's registered, which if you are here, that means you have registered. Okay, so you'll get it in your email. And if you want, you can pop both videos up and watch in stereo. That's probably a great experience. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Thank you all for the comments of appreciation. Uh, was the nine branch menorah created at the time of the oil legend? Oh, gosh. Um, this is a really interesting question, Getty. The history of the menorah itself. Of course, the, the modern menorah with nine branches is modeled on the ancient menorah in the Jerusalem temple with seven branches that represented the divine presence and the seven days of creation. And so if we just add two more branches, we get to nine. Um, it, I don't know when it was created, but I do know that the rabbis describe in, in Tractate Shabbat uh, what will qualify as a menorah. And one thing they describe that looks nothing like a modern menorah, and I have not seen it uh, before is that you can even use a bowl of oil and arrange eight wicks around the edge, right? They they would have been using not modern wax candles, but oil, which oil with wicks. And you can use one lamp and basically dip eight wicks into it that go around the edge. So you have kind of a circular design. There there are uh, modern menorahs that that do look like that uh, from some Mizrahi uh, communities that Mira, our colleague, uh, did a lot of research on. So I will share that with you, Rachel, and I will uh, share some information on that in the follow up as well. Great. We ran a class um, with some thoughts on this and there's yeah. probably a YouTube link to it right at this point. Yes. OK, so we will we will maybe we can get that in the the notes that go out the, the email that goes out after this class. That's a good question. Sure. Uh, all right. I've been told that visions and statements in Daniel correspond to local Zoroastrian beliefs. Not sure about that. Any comments? Um, I am also not an expert in Zoroastrian beliefs. Um, there's always some cross fertilization between different ideas, uh, but I can't really speak to that too definitively. Okay. All right. We are um, at the hour. This is Lots of interesting comments. I see you guys are now chatting with each other a little bit, and that's really wonderful. Um, I'm sorry, but I think we're going to have to respect people's time and leave it there. Uh, thank you all. I uh, hope this was fun. It was fun for me, and it was lovely to see you all and enjoy your last three days of this holiday. Chag Urim Sameach. Thank you, everybody.